Al Jazeera podcast. Horror unfolded as Israeli tanks and troops raided Al Shifa, Gaza's largest hospital, last week. Patients, medical staff, and displaced Palestinians are sheltering in the complex. Among those inside, Dr. Ahmed Mukhalalati. It's really horrible here. It has been continuous bombing. As decomposed bodies piled up outside and inside the building, medical staff started to bury them in one of the hospital's parks. On Saturday, Israeli forces ordered the hospital to be evacuated, according to Palestinian officials, an allegation Israel denies. Hundreds left the complex. The World Health Organization say that Al Shifa Hospital is now a death zone. They describe as they moved into the hospital outside, there was a mass grave. Today, we get to know Al Shifa Hospital through the eyes of a doctor and activist who worked there for years. I'm Malika Bilal, and this is The Take. Before we continue, a note that this interview was recorded on Thursday, before Al Shifa Hospital was evacuated. I am Dr. Mads Gilbert. I'm a Norwegian anesthesiologist and emergency medical physician. I am a professor of medicine at the Arctic University of Norway in Tromsø, and I have my daily work as a senior consultant at the Clinic of Emergency Medicine at the uh, University Hospital of North Norway. Dr. Gilbert was in Johannesburg, South Africa, when we recorded this interview with him. I'm here now on a mission with an experienced Norwegian NGO called Norwegian Aid Committee. Not very big, but we always go to Gaza when there is bombing. And we have unfortunately not been allowed in yet, but we are still doing what we can to get to Gaza, as we always do when there is bombing. So let's talk about that. You've worked in the occupied West Bank and Gaza as an emergency care doctor for decades. Can you walk me through that? How did that start? Well, it started with me being a young medical doctor, politically active, uh, asking myself, what can I do to be of use for the people in the global south who are struggling against colonialism and oppression? And I thought that maybe I should train to be a good emergency physician and learn how to give anesthesia and resuscitate people who are the victims of landmine injuries, wars and occupation. That calling took him to Beirut in 1981, the year when Israeli warplanes bombed Palestinian targets across Lebanon. The Israeli army wanted to kill the then leader of the armed resistance against the occupation, Yasser Arafat. We went down there and we actually established the first emergency medical team to go to support the Palestinian healthcare workers. And then the next year, 1982, the Israeli army invaded Lebanon. It ended with the Sabra and Shatila massacre. So I was there and I experienced firsthand for the first time in my life what it means to be under bombardment from Israel. Dr. Gilbert worked for years in Gaza in its darkest times. He told us he spent countless hours in emergency rooms during Israel's military assaults in 2006. Eight, nine, twelve, fourteen, and twenty-one. Shifa Hospital was once more the main medical facility during the 2014 Israeli attacks on Gaza. It was in 2014 that Israel imposed a lifetime entry ban on Dr. Gilbert. The Norwegian physician Dr. Mads Gilbert had been bringing his medical expertise and much-needed supplies to Palestinians in the Gaza Strip and the occupied West Bank for the previous 25 years. So I know that you have worked at Al Shifa Hospital for years, and you're currently in touch with your colleagues there. Before we get into this recent Israeli raid on the hospital, for those who do not know Al Shifa, and we've only seen it in these videos now of it under bombardment, Can you describe the medical complex for us? What's it like to work there? Yeah, I'm very happy to do that because it's it's a beautiful hospital. 
it's sort of organized in a, in a block, in a square, around a small park in the middle. And then there are pavilions with different specialties. This isn't just your typical hospital. Al Shifa is a major medical complex with a big surgical block, maternity, neonatal, and outpatient clinics, an ICU, a dialysis center, and even a few parks. It has all specialties. It has a very well-developed staff. A lot of very clever doctors and nurses. I've known many of them for the better part of 20 years, and I worked wow. shoulder to shoulder with them during the bombardments that you mentioned. How important is this hospital to Palestinians in the Gaza Strip? Because I know that it has quite a history. It was built during the British Mandate, and it's Gaza's main medical center. Is that right? Absolutely. There are currently around 36 hospitals in Gaza to serve the population of 2.2 million. And Shifa is the trauma center. If you have a trauma system, you have certain functions that every hospital can do, like stop the bleeding, open the airways, uh, give some pain relief or put the patient in anesthesia. But that's only the life-saving stabilization. And then the, the trauma patient is transferred to the trauma center, which is Shifa. Very, very important hospital and a flagship among the hospitals. And the Palestinians are extremely proud of it. I know that on ordinary days, I saw reports that there could be up to 540 doctors working in the halls of a Shifa hospital of various nationalities. But that's not the case right now. Who's there right now? What do we know? Well, right now, I think it is maybe the darkest day in the history of the Shifa hospital. And it is, to me, the darkest day as a medical professional, believing in humanity, believing in the Geneva Convention, believing in the holiness of hospitals as being sanctuaries for care, for compassion, for love, and for solidarity with the sick and wounded. Because in front of our eyes, the Israeli military machine is allowed by Europe and the United States to bulldoze down the buildings of Shifa Hospital. And right now, my last number of uh, healthcare providers in Gaza was 700 patients, 250 staff, and two and a half thousand internally displaced persons. And they have now been besieged for five weeks on top of the siege for 16 years. They have been completely denied water, food, fuel, electricity, medical supplies. And then on top of that, they have been providing health care to many of the 20,000 uh, wounded um, who has been needing surgical care, medical care. The total number of wounded, according to the United Nations, is around 28,000. Probably if you do the math according to our experiences, I believe maybe one-fourth of these 7,000 have been needing surgical medical care. And all these patients, many of them have been coming to Shifa with their wounds, with their open fractures, with their shrapnel wounds, with their burns. So they have put hospitals out of function in Gaza at the same time as they have been bombing the people relentlessly and killing 12,000 and half of the killed, 6,000 killed and missing are children. Maybe the most graphic example of human cruelty to deny premature babies the right to a safe little incubator with warmth, oxygen and um, humidity. And these small prematures yeah. probably touch the heart of the people around the world. But this is only the tip of the iceberg. You mentioned the tip of the iceberg, and I would agree. I'm the mother of one-year-old twins, and when I saw those babies in the incubators, I just, I didn't know my heart could break all over again. This past month has been just 
an exercise in tragedy after tragedy. So I want to talk about it's what not, happened. It's not, a tra- it's not a tragedy. Excuse me. Mm-hmm. Go for it. A tragedy is when somebody bad happens, which was not intentional, like two cars colliding on the way home. It's when a child falls off the chair and, uh, and has a, a brain concussion. That's a tragedy. This is a man-made evil. This is planned to the least detail. It's meant to inflict what we see. This is the most brutal type of abuse of power that you can imagine. To keep a population of 2.2 million incarcerated in a, you could call it a ghetto, you could call it a concentration camp. You can certainly not call it a prison because they have never been punished or, or there has never been a sentence that gave them this judgment. So it's a complete systematic oppression, which then on top has this bombardment and hitting civilian structures and killing all these people. It's not a tragedy. So I don't use the word tragedy. Right. I'm sorry. No, thank you for that. It's very difficult to get updates from inside Al Shifa Hospital without electricity and internet. But Dr. Gilbert has been able to reach some of his colleagues there in the last few days before losing touch. We'll hear what they told him after the break. So, Dr. Gilbert, Israel uses the pretext of underground tunnels to target hospitals in Gaza, and Al-Shifa just is the latest hospital. You have worked there. What do you say to Israel's claim? I say it's another one of the blatant lies that the uh, war machinery of Israel probably needs in order to try to fog for ordinary people, the cruelty of their actions. It's a struggle on the narrative. It's the battle of the narrative. And the Israeli narrative and the US narrative is that the people of Gaza are um, cynical terrorists killing and threatening the white world. Last Wednesday, Israeli army spokesperson Jonathan Conriquez appeared in a video posted by the Israeli army's account on X formerly known as Twitter, touring Al-Shifa Hospital and pointing at what he claimed to be weapons belonging to Hamas. Here's part of it. This bag here, we opened it up in order to make sure that it's safe to touch and show. So please don't give me any of that. You opened it up and you placed it there. This is the bag that we found, and this is the stuff that was in it. Now, there's insignia, military insignia, a knife. For those of you who read Arabic, you'll be able to uh, understand what it says here. But it's uh, Hamas, the military wing, Qatayb al-Qassam, of course, a vest with equipment, and as always, an AK-47. What that video didn't show was any command center or tunnel system inside or underneath the building. The video, posted by the Israeli army on X, was taken down shortly after, only to reappear with some tweaks. By Friday, Israel said they had found what they called a tunnel shaft in the ground near the Al-Shifa complex. The claims that there is a bunker under Shifa or a command center has never been substantiated. And it is also fogging the fact that Israel is systematically attacking Palestinian healthcare, healthcare infrastructure, and healthcare workers. Listen, I've been working in Shifa on and off for 16 years. I've been in every corner of the hospital. I have not examined if there is a command center in Shifa because I'm a doctor. I'm not a a military expert or an intelligence officer for Israel. But I've never been restricted. I've never been asked to, to not take pictures. I take pictures wherever I want. They never check my camera. I've never seen a soldier. I've never seen an armed person in in, in Shifa. I've never seen any of the known faces from the de facto government. I've seen the Minister of Health and he should be there. Otherwise, I've never seen this command center. Okay, if it's under the ground, why do they start taking it down with bulldozer now? Shouldn't we have a forensic committee coming in and 
and proving these allegations. It's all lies. It's all lies. And we saw it the other day with the Rantisi Pediatric Cancer Hospital when they were triumphantly going down in the basement and they found diapers. Oh my God, there was diapers in a pediatric hospital? The Palestinian doctors and nurses. I know their moral values and their standing. Unlike Israeli doctors who demanded more bombing and demanding the bombing of Shifa, they have been loyal to their ethical oath to stay by their patients, to defend the patient, and to be all the time neutral with regards to the treatment of each patient. They would never have allowed a military command center to be placed in the midst of their starship hospital. I know the Deputy Minister of Health, Dr. Youssef Abrish. I know his standards. He would never have loved it. And I would never have worked in a hospital that was a military center. It's an interesting point. Dr. Gilbert, you talked earlier about the situation inside Al Shifa Hospital. You're in touch with your colleagues there regularly. What's the latest? I just have to swallow to tell you. Because the latest is that there is radio silence from Shifa now. We have heard nothing for the last 20 hours. Let me just interrupt to say that we're speaking on Thursday, November 16th. Yeah. And you've heard nothing. From yesterday, we had the last messages coming out from Shifa, from Dr. Yusuf Abrish, the Deputy Minister of Health, and from Dr. Marwan Abu Sada, the head of the International Cooperation in the Ministry of Health. We don't know what has happened to them, we hear that the Israeli soldiers are in all departments of Shifa. We hear that they are actually vandalizing the equipment. They have been smashing the MRI machine, the CT machine in the new Shifa medical complex. We hear that men are being taken prisoner and dressed. And we hear that medical staff is being killed by shooting if they try to move outside. We know that there are around 100 corpses not yet buried. And we know that the previous 24 hours, ICU patients died from lack of oxygen and, and life support equipment. And we know that three of the neonatal babies having taken out of their incubators have died. And 17 other, altogether 40, at least 40 patients died after they lost the oxygen and the last drop of electricity. Dr. Gerbert, I have one final question. Um, you are planning to travel back to Gaza. What makes you go back time and time again? Because I think like every human being in these dark days, we ask ourselves, how can I be of use? How can I be on the side of right? How can I be on the side of life? I want in praxis to show solidarity with a people that has been occupied for, well, you can count 70 years or 60 years or from 67, whatever, for decades being under the ruthless an extremely brutal rule of the Israeli army and the Israeli colonizing of their homes, their land, their lives. I want to be of use and what I can provide is medical solidarity. Not because I think that the Palestinians cannot do the medical work, but because we all need solidarity. Solidarity is not an act of charity. It's an act of unity between people fighting on different grounds towards the same goal equality, justice, and respect for human life. I can provide support with my shoulder. They can lean on my shoulder. I can provide witness accounts. I can do research and tell the world what's going on. And I can show them that they are not alone in these dark hours. And I can be there together with other solidarity workers to show them that they are not alone. 
And that's The Take. This episode was produced by Siri Al-Khalili and Miranda Lynn, with Sonia Bagat, Khaled Sultan, David Enders, Amy Walters, Chloe K. Lee, Ashish Malhotra, Zaina Bazar, Farinisa Campana, and me, Malika Bilal. Our sound designer is Alex Roldan. Tim St. Clair mixed this episode. Alexandra Locke is The Take's executive producer, and Nay Alvarez is Al Jazeera's head of audio. We'll be back. <laughs>